God is bigger than my fear, right? <laughs> my name is Jennifer Huddleston Kelly, and I am an alcoholic. I've been kept sober since December 5th of 92, and that's my miracle, and the Legacy Group is my home group. And it is such an honor and a privilege to get to be at a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'd rather be at a smaller one. Um, you should have heard him laugh at dinner last night when I said, I'm not really big on large crowds. And they cracked up. And hi, everybody over there. Um, I, uh, okay, somebody's probably going to need to get the signer a Red Bull because I'm really amped up right now. Um, <laughs> I want to thank the committee and my hostess and, uh, and all of you for your enthusiasm in Alcoholics Anonymous. This is an amazing event and it's hardly intimidating at all when 20 people have a big book older than me. Um, uh, what I'm instructed to do is tell you in a general way what I used to be like, what happened and what I'm like now. I'm not that good at it in a general way and I hope that you won't be shocked at my worldliness and levity but please know that just underneath it there is a deadly earnestness and that I have not forgotten the fatal malady, and, and that it does, uh, that it is out to kill me. And, and uh, you know, that what we have is a daily reprieve, we have a stay of execution. And what am I willing to do for this one day to protect this gift of sobriety that God gave me? And what I'm willing to do is stand up here and twitch for just a few minutes <laughs> until the oxygen gets back to my brain. Um, I was born at a very early age on November 16th of 1966. That's 111666 for you Revelations fans. And uh, I was born to a football coach and an English teacher. And they are very nice, very boring people. My mom and dad met, they, uh, they dated, they got married, and they had sex in that order. They went to work and they... They went to work and they went to church and they did the right thing even when nobody was looking. And, uh, and I was happy and healthy and well adjusted for almost three whole years. We, we, have, uh, we have pictures. Um, I recognize that this is Alcoholics Anonymous and, and I will try to respect the traditions from the podium. But my first drug of choice was attention. And I have not fully recovered. Um, Though I'm getting there right now. Um, and, uh, and right before I turned three, they brought home a little melon-headed baby named Jill, and she ruined everything. I blamed her for the next 30 years for every decision I made because she interfered with the attention. And she also ruined any opportunity I might have to blame my alcoholism on my parents, because I was willing to blame it on anybody standing still. Um, but she went to high school and graduated. She went to college and graduated in four years. And um, I'm 45 and I'm a sophomore. It's, uh, it's the only thing in my life I've ever paced myself at. Um, and, uh, and after she got out of, uh, out of college, she went to work for Jesus in Bulgaria. My sister was a missionary, and I was a cocktail waitress in a pool hall. Um, <laughs> we were both doing God's work in our own way. Um, and uh, while she was in Bulgaria, she met a Bulgarian man. They met, they dated, they got married, and they had sex in that order. And right up until she had my second niece, she worked for Habitat for Humanity. And, uh, and she did not do that because she had a sponsor that said, you'll die if you don't do service work. She did that because she figured out all by her lonesome that, that being of service to others is a great way to live. I'm not that bright. Um, I, uh, I was born with a twitch. I'm like a human chihuahua in a rather big package. And, um, and I learned to be funny so that it looked like I meant to act this way. Um, I, I went to school and, and I was very involved with Jesus. I know that I neither endorse nor oppose Jesus, but he's part of my story. Um, 
but I, uh, I was very active in the church and I wanted to be a minister when I grew up. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, and I loved the church. I loved what it was about. I loved singing with the Jesus freaks. It was a place where I fit in. But I also loved going to Rocky Horror Picture Show on Saturday night. Let's do the time warp again. And, um, and I already had several different lives going. My drinking began because I fell in love with a guy. And falling in love with guys and drinking goes together quite well. Um, I scared the fish. I have always loved men. I just got one like two years ago. Um, <laughs> almost three. And, um, but I scare the fish. And uh, I was engaged seven times but never married. I'm not a closer. Um, <clears throat> and so this guy moved to town. He came to the First Methodist Church. And, and I wanted what he had. And I was willing to go to almost any lengths to get it. On the outside, he was everything I knew I'd never be. He was tanned, he was toned, he was quaffed, he had a waist. I always wanted a waist. I could have done some real damage with a waist. He was preppy when preppy was the thing to be, and I was goth before goth even existed. And, and, and he was exotic. He had this accent. It was super sexy. He was from Mississippi. And, uh, and I don't get out much, so that's exotic to me. And... And we began to date, and I fell in love as only a 16-year-old girl can. And I started thinking, long before I ever had a drink, I had alcoholic. And, uh, and I wanted to be a minister when I grew up, and I thought, you know, if I'm going to spend the rest of my life talking about sin, I should probably try some. <laughs> and being a nice little church girl, I decided that he was going to deflower me, and then he'd have to marry me. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> And he was perfect. We hated the same people. We were disillusioned by the same things. He taught me how to shoplift. I mean, we had a future. <laughs> and so one night we went out on this date and, and the moon was full and we just gotten a pretty good haul from the mall and there was a little Lionel Richie playing on the radio and that's when I prepared to pounce. I didn't talk to him about the deflowering. I took matters into my own hands. I had seen a couple of Molly Ringwald movies. I had the basic information. <laughs> And so I prepared to pounce, and that's the moment in which he came out of the closet. I know. That's just the first time that's going to happen. Um, and I am so selfish and self-centered, I thought he was gay at me. And um, I spent the next two years trying to convince him he wasn't really committed to that lifestyle. And uh, he still is. Um, <laughs> But I got mad at him, and I got mad at God, and I got drunk. My first time to drink was an act of defiance against God, and I meant it. I was tired of being good. If I didn't get my own way, I was going to do it my way. And, and I started out a closet drinker. Me and my friend Susie got drunk in a closet. And um, <laughs> we had a bottle of Boone's Farm Tickle Pink and a bottle of Real Sangria, the middle school wines, yes. And, um, and we sat on that closet floor and we got drunk. Uh, Susie was a member of the drill team and, um, and she's blonde and she's like the blight of my life because um, those drill team girls are just delightful, aren't they? Um, you see, inside of me beats the heart of Barbie, but my body's made by Tonka. And, uh, I will outlast those broads, but... Um, but I was so jealous, because these are the kind of girls who would say, I'm cold, and everybody would change the thermostat and get, get blankets and stuff, and, and I'm the kind of girl who changes their own tire. And, uh, and so drinking was a, a competition for me. I'm a big fan of competition. I just don't tell people we're competing so that I can win. And, um, and I decided that night that drinking was going to be my thing and I was going to be better at it than Susie because I'm a dainty flower like that. And, uh, and I discovered that I was. I mean, I just instantly took to drinking. She had a half a bottle, I had a bottle and a half, and that's when the fun began. My parents are not drinkers, and so I didn't know anything about drinking until the night I did it. And what I learned is that if you drink a bottle and a half of wine in a two-story house, while you are drinking, the house turns into a ship. <laughs> And 
and we're talking a pirate ship on stormy seas. Because I stood up and, la and lost my balance standing flat-footed on the floor, and I smashed my face into the back of the closet door. And that's when the magic of alcohol began to happen for me. You see, I'm intense, and I'm sensitive, and I'm intensely sensitive. I do, um, I do feeling casseroles. I'm always jealous of people who can do one feeling at a time. And, um, and I, my face made impact with the back of that door, and not only did I not have to feel my emotions, I didn't have to feel my face. <laughs> and that night, Susie and I came out of the closet, quite literally, and we laughed, and we talked, and we wet our pants, and we puked. <laughs> it was the most beautiful night of my life. This is, this is the drunk I'll be trying to get back to for the next 10 years, just wetting my pants with a friend. Um, <laughs> And then we passed out and we came to the next morning and I didn't know anything about drinking but I learned something else that next morning. A hamster had slept in my mouth. My tongue had grown hair. And I leaned over the bathroom and I drank several gallons of water over the bathtub and I drank several gallons of water and I came downstairs and my stomach turned into a lava lamp. And we were at this Hispanic girl's house and her mother made huevos rancheros for breakfast. I know. And so, uh, and so we puked again. And, um, and then I got on a bus to sing for Jesus. And I loved it. I mean, I loved both of those things. I loved how it felt to be a part of doing the right thing and singing with the Jesus freak. And I loved how it felt to run off to the parking lot and to meet with those boys and drink out of that 12 pack. I mean, I loved both of those things. And my book said that I could quit right there. But why? I am having fun. I mean, early in my drinking, there was a tug of war about that. But here's how I decided. You see, I, I would go to church and I would sing those songs and I would hear that sermon and I would get that warm, fuzzy feeling. But about Tuesday, my twitch would start coming back. And I couldn't summon with sufficient force that feeling that I had had on Sunday. But let me tell you about me. Alcohol is so powerful in my life, I don't even have to drink it to feel the effects. All I have to do is plan my next drunk. And I get a sense of ease and comfort that comes over me at once just by planning my next drunk. And so I got drunk. I got drunk and I, I went to jail before I even got out of high school because I'm an overachiever, me and the drunk. <laughs> Me and the gay boyfriend stole the street sign and went to Alcatraz. I mean, I wept uncontrollably. It was terrible. He was on one side of the cell block and I was on the other. And he said the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And I've been in AA almost 20 years. I've heard dumb stuff. <laughs> but this guy said, tell your mom and dad it's my fault. And I said, you can bet on it, buddy. <laughs> you do not have to tell a girl like me to blame you. This is something that came with the package. I am truly grateful for an inventory that showed me that he had neither the brains nor the maracas to come up with this great plan. It was all me. But I tell you that story to tell you this one. The next morning after I got bailed out of jail, I was the youth speaker at the First Methodist Church. I had a big curling iron burn all the way across my forehead. And I can't prove it, but I'm pretty sure that's the day I stopped looking the world in the eye. And it's an important part of my message to tell you that that had nothing to do with them. I still go to that church today, and I believe that I could tell them the story I'm telling you tonight, and they would carry the same message of love and hope to me that they always had. My mother would die. <laughs> but I really believe that they would, they would absolutely carry the same message of love and hope. What changed was me, was my guilt, my shame, and the knowledge in the core of my being that I would drink it again as soon as humanly possible, because it provided for me what, what nothing else ever had. It was okay in a bottle. I, uh, Got out of high school and I went towards college. <laughs> You've heard how well that went. And the reason was I got scared and, and I, uh, the, I really was. I, I just didn't know how to do this. I graduated from a really big high school and I was pretty well known. But I got to college and I was anonymous and I, I just wandered around there with my little headphones on going meh. Cause, um, <laughs> because I don't want you to know I don't know. I, I'm pretty clear on I don't know, but I don't want you to know I don't know because something horrible could happen. You might help me. And, um, 
And I was getting suicidal as soon as I got to college. And thank goodness, back then, the drinking age was 19, and I turned 19 in November, and I got drunk and fell in love. My first night of legal drinking, I fell in love with a guy named Humongous. He was a freshman, too, but he was 28. And um, <laughs> he had long hair and a long beard, and he didn't like shoes. And well, his friends called him Humongous. And, um, <laughs> I still don't know why, but um, <laughs> but that night we got drunk and fell into weird. Um, he there were a couple of things that made him the ideal boyfriend. He had no job and no car. <laughs> For some people that would go on their cons list, but. But men wander off on me, and what I discovered is that if you date a man with no job and no car, you can drop him off somewhere, and when you come back later, he's still there. <laughs> or he's really easy to track, because he's on foot and he looks like Sasquatch. <laughs> and so that night, we put his bicycle in the back of my car, and. And we went off to the commune, and um, it's a much too long story, but um, this was the, the 80s, and Nancy told me to just say no to drugs, so I did for a while. And, um, but Humongous and his friends were saying yes, and uh, this is the al part of my story, the alligator part of my story. Um, he and his friends were tripping on acid, and what I will say for them is they were very organized people. I have noticed that alcoholics get in the middle of a drunk and go, we need a plan. And we have, we have absolutely no equipment to make one with. Now, these guys were doing all their planning on the front end, which is brilliant in its simplicity. And they would build a bonfire and hire a band and synchronize the sundial, whatever. And, um, and they would all do this stuff all at once. And I had a responsibility at these parties. I was the chaperone for their acid trips. And I had two responsibilities. I had to make sure that they didn't run into the fire or touch sharp things. <laughs> and I got instantly good at this job. And I had fun. Now, I didn't know it until I did an inventory in Alcoholics Anonymous, because I have to be sober to get honest about my drinking. But the reason I loved these guys well, they were not the kind of people who were going to say, Jennifer, we're concerned about your drinking. <laughs> they are off naked in a field playing tambourines. They are not <laughs> counting how many beers I'm drinking. And so I got to sit on the cooler and drink the way I like to drink, and nobody bothered me. And it was a beautiful time. I liked having a boyfriend, so I got five or six more. <laughs> Just because this is AA and I'm supposed to be honest, I will tell you that maybe none of them thought of me as their girlfriend. <laughs> but I've noticed that alcoholic women kind of had a sliding scale on what constitutes a relationship. And it's my story, so I get to tell it the way I want to. Can I get an amen? Anyway, um, so I start dating, in quotes, these different guys. And, uh, and I, we didn't go to movies or dances. We got drunk. And I put on costumes and I pretended to be whoever they wanted me to be. And I had fun. And then I came to. And I'd have to figure out what day it was and where my car was and who are you. And... Um, Never a fun exercise. And, and believe it or not, college didn't go that well for me. Um, I wasn't excelling at their higher education, and the boyfriends started finding out about each other, and they invited me to pursue other things. That was really a dark time in my life. I, uh, I walked into a bar with one guy I was seeing, and another guy was there, and I, I'd read some Harlequin romances. I knew what was supposed to happen, and they were supposed to fight for my honor. And, um, and here's what really happened. One guy walked up to another guy and goes, you can have her. And, uh, and the other guy goes, no, 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 dude, I'm pretty sure you had her first. And, uh, and they got to drinking together, sharing stories. And at the end of the night, they're playing rock, paper, scissors. 
to figure out who gets the pleasure of my company or, or gets stuck with it, I'm not sure. And I got furious because I've got that slinky of a mind that twists everything around and suddenly I'm the victim and they've humiliated me. And I got out of that town. I had nine hours of college credit. I was ready to take on the world. <laughs> so I made my big geographic. I moved one zip code away. Um, I'm not brave. I drove over a bridge and a lake and it's a whole new world. And, uh, I got to this new town, it was gonna be completely different. I decided I was gonna get rid of my hippie thing and I was gonna try something new on. And so I decided to be a cowgirl. And I, uh, I went to this place, the first hairdresser shop I could find. I sat down in a chair and I said, toizzle me up some cowgirl hair. I, uh, I started talking like Reba McIntyre at once. And, uh, and this was the 80s and everybody was perming. Dogs were perming, guys were perming, everybody had a perm. And so I got this perm and the girl who was doing my hair, she said, do you, do you party, don't you? And I was like, well, yes, I do. <laughs> I thought it was my aura, because I'd been hanging out with the, with the hippies. I did not know that beer came out your pores. <laughs> and so we got drunk and did my hair, and uh, yes, it's going to turn out exactly as bad as you think. Um, I wound up with this giant shrubbery on top of my head, and... Uh, and then she started cutting, and we were pretty drunk at that point, because what I wound up with was an asymmetric haircut. I had long hair on one side and short hair on the other, which made me look perpetually confused, and, um, and I kind of was. She turned me around in that chair, and there are three heads there, and they've all got bad hair. And she's bobbing and weaving behind me, going, nobody in town has this haircut. And I'm looking in the mirror saying, nobody in town wants this haircut. But she said the magic word. She said, you gonna go honky tonking? And I said, absolutely. Now at this point in my life, I've never honked nor have I tonked. <laughs> but I knew it involved cocktails and, uh, and I was off to the races. I went back to the place. There was a place in downtown with a big orange horse and I got me some hot pink ropers and a belt buckle the size of my head. And, uh, and that night I went to a little place in Lake Dallas called the Moonlighter. It was a swank establishment with a rock parking lot and dually trucks with guns in the gun rack. Romantic little place where when I walked in, all the heads turned. My God is very gentle with me because I was almost 10 years sober before I put together that maybe my lopsided hair could have had something to do with that. <laughs> But what I know is that at the Moonlighter, those men treated me special. They would say romantic things like, sit on my lap and I'll be, buy you a burr. <laughs> and I would. And the reality of it was that I was 19, 20 years old. I was a full-blown alcoholic and I was eager to please. And, uh, and I went off uh, to be a honky-tonk angel by night. By day, I was a preschool teacher, which I do not recommend <laughs> if you're going to be hung over every day of your life. Um, because there were a bunch of little four-year-olds going, Miss Jennifer, Miss Jennifer, Miss Jennifer. <laughs> and I got one of those hangovers where if I sneeze, one of my eyeballs will shoot right out of my head. <laughs> so Miss Jennifer's saying, we're going to need to be quiet today. <laughs> and I'm detoxing in the daycare. And, um, <laughs> and I'm grateful that's funny today. Because I knew that it was a privilege to get to take care of those kids, and yet alcoholism is much stronger than my desire to do the right thing. As a matter of fact, while working at that daycare, I began to use outside issues. It's not something I'm proud of. As a matter of fact, it's the thing I'm greatly disappointed in myself about because I was never going to do that. But it's one of the ways that I know the progression of this disease because I had said no to it a million times. I was at a party with the girl who screwed up my hair and she offered it to me one more time. And I said, I'm not gonna do it. And she said the magic word. She said, it'll make you last as long as the party. And I said, get out of my way. <laughs> and, uh, and I crossed a line I was never gonna cross, one of many that I was never gonna cross. And off we go. And, uh, and it made me a very quick preschool teacher. I, um, and eventually I quit teaching preschool to go be a bartender and because uh, pretty much it's the same job as drunks and four-year-olds. It's just the refreshments are better at the bar and, uh, and I got paid to drink and at least that's the way I looked at it. My employer had a different idea. Then that's when I started getting DWIs and I got one and 
that's no big deal. I mean, I just kind of figured, it's like patches in the Girl Scout. All party girls get one DWI. It's like waking up with a guy who, you know, in the morning has fewer limbs than he did when you were dancing with him the night before. It happens. Um, so you get your patch, and... Um, Wish that weren't a true story. Um, Cause I still have flashbacks on that one. Um, but I, I just figured that happens. And then less than six months later, I'm on the side of the road getting a second DWI. And man, if you want to make the state of Texas mad, get a second DWI before you've been convicted on your first. Yeah. Um, and so that's when I started really thinking about things. And, and I discovered I did have a problem had a driving problem. And um, <laughs> so I moved next door to my bar of choice. I got me a home bar. And uh, <laughs> I thought that would solve the problem. And what happened to me was I sat on the same bar stool. This is not what happened. The way that my disease progressed is that I sat on the same bar stool night after night, day after day, week after week, year after year, developing what my friend Blind Joe calls the skid row of the soul. And um, and there were men and no men, jobs and no jobs, utilities and no utilities. I'm an alcoholic woman, and so I put myself in situations and circumstances that I had to be sober to get out of, and I was never sober. And some things began to happen to me that were, uh, I could no longer call a party. But it is one of the reasons that I know that I'm an alcoholic, because my book tells me that these situations and circumstances that I found myself in would be a su sufficient reason for a heavy drinker or a normal drinker to stop or moderate. But I am not a normal drinker or a heavy drinker. I'm an alcoholic. And one of the very first words that I ever looked up in Alcoholics Anonymous was oblivion. Because our book says that's why we drink. We drink sinking oblivion. And, and the definition that I found was to seek to forget or to be forgotten. And that's why I drank. From then on out, it was no longer about play. It was no longer about fun. It was drinking to forget or to be forgotten. And gradually, things got worse. And. Uh, the rest of my drinking is just the same thing, night after night, day after day, week after week, year after year. As I said, I was, uh, I was engaged seven times but never married, and, uh, and I wound up after the last engagement going home. We got really close that time. He went into the Navy, so he forgot what a jerk I was, and I forgot what a jerk he was, and we tried to get married shipped ashore, and that was delightful. And, um, <laughs> But thank goodness, you know, he finally, he kind of forgot and married somebody else. And, uh, <laughs> and I went home to my mom and dad, and I brought alcoholism home to them, and they were watching me die one day at a time. And, uh, but I still drank in that other town, and so I was driving there after work. And, and one night I headed home, and I got a felony DWI. And, and I, it wasn't the most trouble I'd ever been in, and it's not the most afraid I ever was. The only thing I know is that I told the truth that night. When they asked me how much I'd had to drink, I told them $67 worth, because that's how much the tab was. And when we got to the interrogation room, when they asked me if I thought I had an alcohol problem, I said yes. And when they asked me if I thought I was an alcoholic, I said yes. I don't know why. Except when I came to AA, they talked about being sick and tired of being sick and tired. And that sounded just about right. I do know that I got a sense of comfort, of relief from just saying those words. And I sat in a jail cell and I had a moment of clarity. I always recommend a jail cell is a pretty good place to have one. Um, <laughs> and I thought about why I drank. And I drank for the very same reasons that I come to Alcoholics Anonymous. I wanted to fall in love. I wanted to laugh. I wanted to be a part of something. But you see, alcohol took away what it had initially provided. And I was going back with the hopes that something that it had given me in the beginning would come back and it just didn't. And for the very first time, I sat in that jail cell and I, I didn't feel like what's a nice girl like me doing in a place like this. That night I realized that I belonged in that cell because the only way that I knew how to halfway feel okay was to put something in my body that made me a danger to myself and to others. And the only way that you could be safe was if I was locked up. And I sat in a jail cell and I thought about the meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous and I made a vow that I would go right up until they let me out. 
And then I went to go see my high-priced attorney, and uh, he worked out of his garage, and <laughs> he didn't have any good news for me. And, uh, and I started to go to AA, but then I, I knew this guy who had eight DWIs, and um, here's a man with a real answer. So <laughs> I went back to my home bar, and I went to go talk to Jimmy. And, and the only thing that happened when I went to go see Jimmy is that I told him when they set my drinks on the bar that I wasn't drinking that night. And he sat down with Jimmy and I told him about the trouble I was in. Jimmy looked across the table from me and he said, Jen, I can afford to be the kind of drunk I am, but you can't afford to be the kind of drunk you are. And I know that what Jimmy was talking about was money because he'd been paying his attorney in cocaine and, uh, and he'd been postponing his consequences. He knew he wasn't going to get out of it. He was just postponing it. But what I thought about that night was what I had paid willingly to get drunk. And it was everything of any value in my entire life. Nobody ever took it from me. I gave it away. I traded it for a temporary sense of ease and comfort. And I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that nothing good could ever come in my life and stay unless I could learn a way not to drink. Because drinking took away everything good that ever came into my life. The other thing that happened was that at some point there was a drink in front of me and I had been drinking before I recognized that I had made a decision to drink. And I knew I could never get or stay sober by myself because I had not intended to drink that night. And it scared me to death. I spent the next 10 days driving around an AA group. Do we have any orbiters? I, um, from sunup to sundown, I drove around a little greenhouse in Plano, just around and around. And I would lock myself in my parents' bathroom and practice saying, my name is Jennifer and I'm an alcoholic. Oh, God, no. I would just cry. And on December 4th of 1992, I reached what my book calls the jumping off place, where I could no longer imagine life with or without alcohol. I was desperate. And I made a deal with God in the parking lot of that little that little group with that little greenhouse, and I told God I would go to one meeting, and if I heard something I could hang on to, I'd go back for one more, and that was the only thing I could promise. If it didn't work, I was going to kill myself. And God can work with that kind of willingness. Because I walked into the Plano group, and it was a wonder to behold. It's the quintessential AA group. It had brown walls. Nobody w knows what color they started out, but they were brown when I got there. <laughs> you opened up the door, and the smoke poured out, and... Uh, and the Plano group was the place where furniture goes to die. <laughs> Y'all got some of those too, huh? When grandma says that couch has got to go, it goes to the Plano group. And, uh, and the first chair that I sat down in was made out of two by fours. It had a wagon train and velveteen on it. I think that's from the era in which it was made. And it rocked, I mean, really, naturally. And, uh, but it had these divots in the handles where newcomers sat and rocked and sat and rocked and sat. <laughs> and that became my chair. And I sat down, and they turned out the lights, and they lit the candles, and a wonderful thing happened. I knew I was in a cult, but I had... <laughs> But I had nowhere else to go. I mean, nowhere else to go. And the miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous began to happen to me that night because Alcoholics Anonymous brought their best to me. Now, the first half of the meeting was a little shaky because I hadn't had a drink nor a meeting in 10 days. I had read the book by myself, which didn't do a lot of good. Um, but I didn't want to sound dumb, so I bought a book at Half Price Books because I wasn't willing to invest the full five dollars. <laughs> Look, you know how many times I've joined Weight Watchers? I mean, I'm not really that enthusiastic about long-term solutions. Um, and I think I had equal amounts of fear that it wouldn't work and that it would. But I sat down in that meeting and I sat there and twitched through the first half of that meeting and I listened to people share and, and I didn't understand a word you were saying. Nothing. Because one of the things that we forget is that the person we're talking to doesn't understand us if we start talking our secret lingo. Sponsor and phenomenon of craving. Are you kidding me? And then one of my greatest teachers in Alcoholics Anonymous shared. His name was Gene. And Gene had a beard down to here and a, and a a camo fishing cap. He looked like one of the Duck Dynasty guys. <laughs> I've been saying ZZ Top, but now I have a new frame of reference. And, um, 
And Jean was not a member of the Mensa, but Jean knew exactly how to talk to a newcomer. And what Jean said was, I didn't know I was an alcoholic. Hell, I just thought I was thirsty. <laughs> and I'm crying uncontrollably, going, me too, Jean. <laughs> and what he said after that changed my life. He said, but my problem is, the more I drink, the thirstier I get. Shazam! <laughs> You see, I'd been running this 10-year experiment at my home bar, watching these mooks with the watches. I don't know where I watch now. I know it's got them really twitching up here. Um, but these people would wear a watch to a bar, and not only would they wear it, they'd do what it said. They'd have one drink, maybe two, a shot on their birthday, and then they would look at the watch, and the watch would say, go home, and they would go. <laughs> And I would watch these mooks night after night do this thing. Oh, look at the time. Mama's got dinner waiting on me. And I would go, why would you do that? We have pretzels here. Why would you do that? And they would go home. Some other guy would go, oh, look at the time. The game's about to start. And that's when I would turn into the flight attendant. We have TVs here, here, and here. <laughs> Why would you do that? But I drank in that same home bar for about seven years, and, and my question changed from why would you do that to how do you do that? Because I couldn't, and Gina explained why. The more I drink, the thirstier I get, and it begins with the very first drink, so the kicker is I gotta not take that first drink. And what he said was that he got a sponsor who taught him how to work 12 steps, and in that process, he got a higher power that he, he chose to call God, I think God chose to call Jean Jean. Um, <laughs> it's my thing, sorry. Um, and, uh, and he hadn't been thirsty for a really long time, and I knew that man, uh, that man understood me. And I knew I qualified for Alcoholics Anonymous because I was just like Jean. And at the end of the meeting, they asked me if I'd like to share, which was a terrible mistake because I haven't shut up since. <laughs> except for one month when I was like 10 years sober and my sponsor said I'd just like to listen. And, uh, and that's what I would say in meetings, my sponsor says I'd just like to listen. Because um, I'm real humble like that. And, uh, but, uh, but I listened to what, what went on in that meeting. And I think we, it's really important for us to remember that, that AA is what we show the newcomer that it is. And it's really not their job to figure out that what's on the door is what we are. But what I heard in that meeting was I'm an alcoholic and a, and a, and a, and a, and a, and so I thought you had to be an and a. So I became one right then. I said, my name's Jennifer and I'm an alcoholic and a thief, a whore, and a liar. <laughs> I didn't know that when you said alcoholic, you pretty much had the rest of that covered. <laughs> And the only reason I was safe saying it that way was that I looked like Pat from Saturday Night Live. I did. You didn't know what, I looked like an it. I had short hair, a ball cap, boys shoes, I had some sweats that had become my uniform. They did not know what it was, but it wept a lot. And, uh, and honestly, I thought I was a lesbian that didn't like women, so there was a little bit of confusion going on. I thought they were going to have to write a pamphlet just for me, but... Um, <laughs> a little bit confused uh, but I went on to share how I'd been dying one day at a time and I told him some of the things that I've been doing and I told him that the thing I was most ashamed of was that I knew I'd never get or stay sober by myself and those tacky people smiled and nodded I thought they should at least weep with me oh she's got a tooth <laughs> they smiled and nodded and what I didn't know was you can fool the fans but you can't fool the players and that night I was just desperate enough to be a player in Alcoholics Anonymous. At the end of the meeting I got the hugs and the desire chip and, and they, uh, they told me to go to Denny's. I used to say they asked me to go to Denny's. I now know they told me because newcomers are really busy. <laughs> I mean, we don't want to go anywhere if we don't know what's going on, you know. And so they must have told me to go because I went. and. Uh, and I went thinking that's where you filled out the paperwork. Um, 
and I sat down in that, in that Denny's and some things began to happen to me. I discovered that there exists among us a fellowship and a friendliness that is indescribably wonderful. You laughed at things that were not funny. You have no volume control. <laughs> I have no idea why it's called anonymous, because people kept saying, isn't that just like an alcoholic? <laughs> and I am underneath the menu singing kumbaya, because I am dying. <laughs> that ego comes back real quick. I'm sitting underneath that menu going, I was the almost homecoming queen in 1985. <laughs> you heard what I looked like that night. and um, But you made me laugh. I didn't know that if you're at Denny's at three in the morning, you're a member of AA or a future member of AA. There's nothing to worry about. But right away, I had friends, I had fellowship, I had laughter, and without my permission, I began to have a solution. And I showed up to Alcoholics Anonymous, and you accidentally set the hook. This guy walked up to me, and he goes, hey, your name's Jennifer, right? And I'm like, whoa, whoa. <laughs> what have you heard, you know? And uh, he said, really, is your name Jennifer? I said, yeah. He said, did you drink today? I said, no. And he said, welcome to your second day of sobriety. And the big deal. It's not that he knew it was my second day of sobriety. The big deal is he knew my name. And I don't ever want to forget that. The big deal was he knew my name. And I fell in love with you. I came back because I couldn't wait to hear your stories. Before I had a God of my understanding, I had you. I had your stories and I came back to hear what happened next. You were better than anything on TV. I had to see if Chris and Richard broke up and I needed to know what happened next. If Bob got a job and, you know, all kinds of stuff began to happen. I got a sponsor because I got bullied into it. You know, the women, the women and the little pecs and herds, get a sponsor, come to the women's meeting, get a sponsor. They just, they pecked, they just pecked and pecked and pecked. And I got a sponsor. Now, I didn't know. I didn't know. The first woman I asked, they told me to find somebody I could relate to. The first woman I asked had three days of sobriety. That is a dumb thing to tell somebody. <laughs> but eventually, I found a woman with multiple years of sobriety. She hadn't worked on all 12 steps. I didn't know it, and it didn't matter. I did what she told me to do. And she got me active in Alcoholics Anonymous before I really knew what AA was. She used to make me pick up Janet from another planet. <laughs> And please hear me before I tell this, this story that Janet is one of my greatest teachers in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I honor her. I love her. I, do, I have no idea where she is, but she truly taught me something that no one else could. Janet had problems other than alcoholism. I have no idea if she's an alcoholic or not, but she showed up for the meetings and she said that she had a desire to stop drinking. And she, uh, I think she had had electroshock therapy because Janet could not retain information. And so I would pick her up and I would drive her to the group and she would say, how old are you? And I'd say, I'm 26, Janet. And she'd start changing the dials on my radio. Oh. <laughs> and then she'd turn around and she'd say, how old are you? And I'd say, 26, Janet. And we were only going like three blocks and she'd ask me eight times how old I was. And we'd get to the meeting and I'd been told I had to sit and listen and Janet would be everywhere. She had this giant bag that was like Mary Poppins. I mean, she was pulling all kinds of stuff out of this bag and she was up and down and up and down. And these people in AA, I knew they were crazy because they just have their meeting with Janet doing whatever Janet was doing. <laughs> and I couldn't do anything but focus on Janet, like, hello? Somebody fix Janet. And nobody would do it. And I'd drive her home and she'd ask me eight times how old I was and I just got to where I'd say, older now, Janet. <laughs> and I'd drop her off at the house and she'd walk inside and I'd think she's going in there to call me. And that's what she was doing. I'd get back to the group to detox from driving Janet home and the phone would ring and it would be Janet and she'd say, I'd need a ride to the next meeting and I had just dropped her off. <laughs> and my sponsor would make me go back and get her. And this went on and on and on. And I would call my sponsor. I'm so mean. I would just cry. I hate Janet. Please make somebody else get her. 
and she'd say, why are you still here? And I mean, seriously, Janet would shave her legs in meetings with shaving cream. Really? <laughs> and so I start taking Janet back and forth to these meetings, and during this time, my sponsor told me I had an enormous ego. And I felt so sorry for her because she was sponsoring a lot of women. I'm low self-esteem, I'm not enormous ego, but I didn't tell her that to straighten it all out. I just let her slide. <laughs> and so I, I drive Janet to the meeting and we're on the way back and all of a sudden I realize God's put Janet in my life. I'm supposed to help Janet. I mean, nobody else is doing this job, it's my turn. So I begin to 12-step Janet in the car. I said, Janet, I'm going to need a favor out of you. These meetings are real important, and, and I get something out of every meeting I go to, and maybe if you would sit down <laughs> and listen, maybe you could find you a sponsor. And with a sponsor, you could work the steps, and maybe if you work the steps, your life would totally change. And y'all, I saw it. The lights came on. And I got so excited because I knew she was fixing to ask me to sponsor her. And so I did what would become a pattern. I kept talking until I snuffed that out completely. <laughs> and Janet said, Jennifer, I got a question for you. And, I, and it's our moment of truth here. And I know that God's in the car. And that's what Janet says, how old are you? <laughs> And I'm watching Janet walk inside and I start laughing and crying and banging my head on this steering wheel. And then by about the third bang, I realize I have an enormous ego. Because I think Janet needs to change. And the reality is that the 12 steps are a way for me to change so that Janet can be whoever she is. And I began to work the steps like my life depended upon it. I got a sponsor who could work the steps out of the book because my first sponsor didn't know how. And I, and I had a crazy woman who, who sponsored me and she read the book and when we came to a step, we worked it. And one by one, little by slow, day after day, I began to change. I've done everything wrong in Alcoholics Anonymous that you can possibly do, except that I have never stopped going to meetings, I've never not had a sponsor, and I haven't picked up a drink. And guess what, you can mess up and stay. You just got to do those simple things that they teach you in the very beginning. I sat in meetings forever waiting for the super secret. No, the super, super secret. <laughs> and they had told it to me at my very first meeting. But I began to change. And what changed for me was that I stopped living from the inside out. And I got to learn how to live for this way where the God on the inside of me could shoot up this way. Instead of, you know, I, this is how I always lived. If you thought I was wonderful, I was wonderful. If you thought I was terrible, I was terrible. And all of a sudden, I get a God on the inside of me that's just going to sustain me no matter what. And that took me a long time. I was probably more than 10 years sober before I truly believed that God was going to provide everything that I needed. And I got to work with a ton of crazy women. I never get a sane one, and they don't last long with me. I, they don't. I always love it when people say, how many women are you working with? Because it takes fractions, you know? <laughs> and I know I don't do it like a lot of other people. For a long time, I was very rigid, and I decided this is how we do it, and it's the only way we do it. And I discovered I needed to read the doctor's opinion 9,000 times. And if they disappeared, they disappeared. And if they got better, super. But either way, I got to sit down and I got to read the doctor's opinion over and over and over again. And I hope something else happens. But if it doesn't, then grab another one and sit down and let's do the doctor's opinion again and again and again and again. And what happened is I'm a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I have a sponsor and I am a sponsor. I got to fall in love in Alcoholics Anonymous. Well, he's not an AA. But, <laughs> I mean, I tried, but I still scare the fish. Um, but I met a guy that I dated in high school, and he was a nice guy, so I ran him off over and over again. And when I was 40 years old, I got an email, I got a message on, f not Facebook, that's way too cool, MySpace. <laughs> it was back in the day, and I was sponsoring like 15, 15 year olds, and so I had to get on MySpace to find out what they were really doing. <laughs> 
And this guy sent me a message, and, and, uh, and it took that long for me to really want a good guy in my life, and it took every meeting that I ever went to. And, uh, and, I, and I brought him here and threw an AA party, and I cornered all my friends and said, if you see anything weird, you tell me. Because I no longer trusted my, uh, I no longer trusted my judgment. And my best AA friend at the time said, he's precious. He's what we've always wanted for you. And I said, how do you know? He didn't say anything. <laughs> and he said, because Steve looks at you like we look at you. And we love you. So I married him. And, um... <laughs> We had this wedding that was like a cross between a wedding and a Y-Paw, and uh, it was just craziness. It was a beautiful day, and, uh, and it was so much fun, and my AA friends were everywhere. And my daddy cried on my wedding day, not because I looked so beautiful, but because you were so kind. He'd never seen you act the way that you acted at my wedding. He'd never been around you. And, uh, and he couldn't believe what amazing friends I had in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I said, what were you expecting? Those people with the brown paper bags and the trench coats? And he said, yeah. <laughs> and I said, that was before. <laughs> and we have had fun. We, he is not a, he's not a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't think he needs to be. I, as best I can tell, the only consequence of his drinking is that he feels like he should sing. And um, <laughs> to me. Um, <laughs> But he is a great fan of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and when we got married, uh, some people were asking if we were going to have babies. This was a first marriage for both of us. And it was a little late in the game. And I said, we'll let God decide. And two years ago, we were pregnant. And nine weeks later, we weren't. And um, no, but it's a really cool story because God gave me absolutely everything that I needed through that time. I went to the meeting I needed to go to so that I could get on my knees and say the third step prayer and give that baby in my marriage to God because I was freaked out. I got to ride around with my husband and pick baby names. And when things went wrong, I had the absolute perfect doctor who told me what it would look like if things were going right and who told me what it would look like if things were going wrong. And when things went wrong, I cried. I've never heard that bad. For three days, I cried. And then I woke up and said, what's next? And I don't understand how that happened. I really thought I did something wrong. I walked around for a year thinking I did something wrong because I was OK. And I kept thinking, I'm not supposed to be OK. I've had breakups in sobriety that jacked me up for eight years, y'all. I'm not that well adjusted. <laughs> I'm not that powerful, but 12 steps and a God of my understanding is. He absolutely is, and I walked through that without a thought of drinking. And a year later, on that anniversary, I got asked to talk at this chick thing. Ugh. <laughs> I'm getting better, but seriously, y'all. There's just a lot of estrogen in one place, and I... So I go to this chick thing, and we, at, at one of the workshops, they're doing this funtivity, and, um, <laughs> and I got this big badge that says speaker on it, and, uh, and they start to explain the funtivity, and we're going to stand in a circle, and people are going to whisper in our ears. We're going to close our eyes, and they're going to whisper in our ears, and they're going to whisper messages from God. <laughs> and y'all, I start flipping out. <laughs> I am so ready to run, and my friend Nancy B's standing there, and she's got that same look on. And she's got a big speaker badge on, too. And I'm like, I'm staying if you're staying. So we close our eyes, and the first lady, thank goodness, the first lady whispered in my ear looked as scared as me. And so I close my eyes, and, I'm, and she, she starts to say these things into my ear. And the very last thing, just like an afterthought, what she said was, and you're a wonderful mother. And I was so angry. Then these tears just shot out of me. I was so mad. And just like in the book, when that thought came, who are you to say there is no God? 
this thought came and it wasn't for me, it was who told you you're not a mother? And I realized that I did what God told me to do. I gave that baby to him and I left it there and that's why I was okay. Alcoholics Anonymous and those 12 steps are powerful enough to walk through anything and we can be okay. Falling in love with Big Daddy has just been the most amazing experience of my life. It really has. But I tell you what, if he loses his mind and runs off tomorrow with somebody else, I'm going to be okay. Because I know who I am, what I am, and whose I am. We had a very charmed courtship, but the last six months have been woo orientation. We have tried out all of the vows. Job, no job, health, no health, money, no money. <laughs> and what we discovered was the same thing that I, I learned in AA, teamwork makes the dream work. We can do together what we can't do separately. So if you're new or you feel like you're new, let me just explain to you, AA is so flippin' simple. It really is. It's not necessarily always fun, and sometimes happy, joyous, and free isn't on the menu temporarily. <laughs> but it's just monkey see, monkey do. It's so easy. <laughs> the very hardest part is figuring out and staying convinced that you too are a monkey. I'm so grateful I get to hang with you. I'm glad to be here. It's a good day to be sober.